Any views or opinions expressed in this podcast are strictly the views or opinions of the presenter. Nothing in here is the view of the firms, corporations, financial entities that anybody represents. Uh, nothing expressed here is a view of any um, regulator or semi-regulatory agency. Uh, all content is intended to be educational. Nothing in this episode construes specific investment advice. And if you do require advice, you should seek an appropriate advisor, be that a financial planner or a tax advisor or possibly a lawyer. And welcome back to the CE Drive podcast. This is Jason Watt. Uh, this episode will be good for um, life insurance credits in all jurisdictions, um, no accident and sickness credits in Alberta. And I just want to talk for a moment here about BC. So um, BC is in the midst of rev revising its rules. There's kind of two things happening right now in British Columbia. And the first thing is that they've um, tightened up their CE rules a little bit. And the second is that they are sometime this summer, it sounds like rolling out a pre-approval system, which is not there yet. So we won't see it right away. Um, and I'm actually going to try and get somebody from the Insurance Council of BC onto the podcast at some point here. Uh, it's really interesting what they're doing. Um, but anyways, it's a principles-based approach to continuing ed. So if you're a resident of British Columbia, this only matters if you're a resident, or if you live in Atlantic Canada where there's no CE requirement and you have, or the Yukon for that matter, um, any of the jurisdictions with no CE requirements and you have a BC license. So if you're either a resident of BC or a resident of a jurisdiction with no CE requirement, this matters for you. So the deal is that courses like this, a financial planning course are only good for uh, life insurance credits to the extent that you do this kind of business. So if you do a lot of um, financial planning work, especially retirement planning work, as you'll hear in the episode, um, this is probably good CE for you. Um, I say probably because uh, there's some interpretation here. Um, there will be more of a firm set of rules around this, but as of today, um, yeah, it's interpretation of a principle. And the principle here is, would this be relevant to a life insurance agent's work in British Columbia? So um, it's a little bit tricky. I don't know exactly where that line is going to be drawn. I, again, this is where I'd like to have somebody on the podcast to talk about this and hope we can get that. Um, other than insurance credits, this will be approved for an advocates credit, a financial planning credit with FP Canada, a professional development credit with IROC, and a retirement planning credit with MFDA. And I just want to mention, we did have one episode that went live, the um, interview with me, actually, with me interviewing me. Um, it went live without having all the CE approvals in place. So some of you might have done the quiz um, or looked for the quiz and it wasn't available yet. It'll be there now. I do apologize for that. We had a little bit of a um, miscommunication around um, what happens there. Okay, the object for today is a map. It's one of these um, scratch maps. So you scratch off the places you've been. And my wife bought it for me. Uh, we're both travelers. We travel quite a bit. I think I mentioned that before. Um, and she bought it for me the year before, the Christmas uh, before COVID struck. Um, so I haven't scratched anything new off of it yet. Um, we have, I think I have about 32 or 33 countries crossed off um, from there, scratched off. And uh, I'm hoping to add some more, but uh, hasn't happened in a while now. So um, before we get into the interview, so you're here, I uh, talk with Aaron Hector here. Aaron is an incredibly knowledgeable and technically proficient financial planner. And you're going to hear a reference to a rights or things return. I think I say rights and things. It's probably a rights or things return um, a couple times in the episode. And I just thought it would be worthwhile to discuss the rights or things return. Um, so when a taxpayer dies, so the testator, that person dies, uh, we have up to four, up to four tax returns that can be filed in association with that person's death. So 
you're going to have just the basic terminal tax return. That's where you would cover off any income earned in the year of death, earned and paid in the year of death. You would cover off dispositions of assets. So any capital property that's deemed disposed, you would cover any sort of RSP disposition. So anything that's not subject to a rollover, either on the capital gains RSP RIF side would be captured there. So that's the sort of expected tax return. Then we have three other returns. And those other returns have the advantage of letting us move income that might otherwise show up on that terminal tax return onto another tax return. So the benefit to this is that you start over from zero as far as your marginal tax rates go, and there's a bunch of tax credits, notably the basic exemption, that show up a second time here. So you really can income split with your dead self. So the three other optional returns are the rights or things return, which we're gonna chat about here, the return for the final beneficiary of a testamentary trust, uh, which is not gonna be all that common, um, and then the return for the final, for a partner in a partnership, sorry. So those are two other ones. We won't get into those right now, uh, but a tax planner um, should know those. I promise you, Aaron knows about those. So the rights or things return allows us to take amounts that are paid as a result of death, but weren't necessarily paid at that time. So they're paid after death for an amount owing from something that happened beforehand. The most common rights or things are gonna be employment related. Um, you could have banked vacation pay, for example. Let's say that your employer keeps a pool of vacation pay for you and they didn't pay that up before you died. Then your death, the employer says, well, we better pay that out to the estate. Well, that amount can go on to a rights or things return. Uh, the other uh, big ones here are the final old age security payment, and you'll hear Aaron talk about that. Um, and then there's some investment amounts. So if you have um, uncashed matured bond coupons or unpaid dividends, dividends that were declared but not paid, so the timing on that would have to be um, just so. The um, Sorry about that. And then for farmers, uh, supplies on hand, inventory and accounts receivable, if a farmer or fisher and use the cash accounting method, um, livestock that's not part of a basic herd and harvested farm crops. So the farming question always shows up here. There's a few other odds and ends, but essentially it's those amounts that were earned before death, but not paid until. Okay. It's worth filing the rights and things return because you're going to move income into lower tax brackets. So when Aaron brings that up, it's absolutely a valid um, financial planning point. A good accountant will take care of this on the um, estate returns or dealing with the uh, executor to get the tax returns filed. It's a reason not to DIY your um, final year's taxes. So I would really urge people to go and pay a good tax professional to get all the stuff done at death. There's all kinds of reasons to do it, that being one. Okay, let's roll into the interview. Hi, I'm here today with Aaron Hector. Aaron is a financial planner based in Calgary. And Aaron, you're a CFP, RFP, TEP, anything else back there? Uh, those are the main ones. Yeah. Uh, do you count my university degree? I don't, I don't know if we do that or not. But, well, yeah. don't want to overlook it. I'm sure some real <laughs> effort went into that. So um, out of curiosity, is your background, your university degree, is it something related to the field or did you, are you like me and you came from a complete uh, different area? Uh, so no, I have a finance degree, which uh, I think helped with, you know, certainly the understanding of numbers, but uh, most people, I think, would agree that when you go through a finance program at university, it's mostly tiered toward corporate finance and less so much um, with personal finances. So, did you go helpful. to UFC? Yeah, I went through UFC at Haskane. Yeah. Uh, did you have classes with Larry Wood then? I did. Yeah. Uh, I, I like Larry a lot. He's a pretty funny guy. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a, I'm a big Larry Wood fan. So, yeah, excellent. Um, for those that don't know, Larry Wood is, he was one of the original, he was teaching financial planning at U of C before we called it financial planning in Canada. So yeah. this is, yeah, that's awesome. Um, so on the um, practice side then, can you tell us a little bit about your practice? Sure. Um, so 
I work under a couple of brands, actually. Um, so the company that I first started my career with um, is called Doherty and Bryant Financial Strategists. When I first came on, it was just Doherty Financial. Um, the gentleman, Russ Doherty, who hired me, he was a one-man shop, and I was really his first full-time hire. And a couple of years after that, he partnered up with a gentleman named Vic Bryant and Doherty and Bryant was formed at that time. Uh, we grew that company to a staff of about 10. And then we were acquired by a firm called TE Wealth. Uh, so TE, not, not to be confused with the bank TD, but TE Wealth is a is a national financial planning and, and wealth management firm that has offices in most of the major cities across Canada. Uh, and I guess a little bit of the background is Russ and Vic earlier on in their careers had actually um, been quite instrumental in, in building up the Calgary TE office. So a lot of the same people um, knew each other. So I, I currently work under both the TE Wealth brand and also the Doherty and Bryant brand, but most of my clients, just because of the history, um, know me through Doherty and Bryant. And um, yeah, we, we work with um, for usually pretty successful families. Um, so a lot of senior executives, um, successful business owners. Um, we... Um, we have some relationships where we're just involved purely on the financial planning side of the equation um, without investment management. Uh, the, the origins to our company is that with Doherty and Bryant, we didn't have an investment management component, uh, but now with TE Wealth, we do. So um, some of our clients are strictly you know, fee-only type clients. Uh, we, we also will do fee-for-service financial planning work as well as you know, separate engagements. Um, but the majority of my clients are private clients um, who I've known for many, many years. And uh, it's kind of a total wealth offering where we're, we're doing investments. Uh, we'll do tax preparation, um, estate planning work. Um, and um, yeah, I get, our model is a little different. Um, we kind of flip, flipped it on its head a little bit. So, you know, in a lot of the banks, you'll have several investment advisors with sort of a roving financial planner that supports uh, a large number of investment uh, individuals. In our office, there are way more financial planning professionals and uh, few uh, investment advisors. So the primary relationship um, typically falls with the financial planner. Um, and then, you know, there might be one investment professional for every three or four um, financial planning professionals. So it's, it's a little bit of the opposite. And um, we, we find that with that model, we're able to really get a lot um, more into the weeds when it comes to the planning side of the equation, which um, I really love. Yeah. You're, you're presenting planning first and then everything else is an add on to the planning. Yeah, that's right. That makes yeah. a lot of sense. And uh, I know you do taxes as well. Does it, so are you actually preparing tax returns for clients or is that you have an in-house uh, tax preparation team? Yeah, so we, we work as a team. Uh, there's a couple of CAs uh, on, in our office. Um, so when it's required, we have that expertise. Um, I would say I'm, I'm very you know, front and central to the majority of the, the client tax returns that we do in the office. And it just kind of learned that over many years, both of, both of those gentlemen who uh, hired me, Russ and Vic were CAs. So there's been a lot of education uh, on the tax side that's you know, flowed down through the years. Um, and so we kind of, when the need is there in a more complicated case, we have the support we need. Um, but yeah, I've, I've got my hands right in the middle of um, preparing tax returns for sure. Yeah, I see this on the Financial Planning Association of Canada forums, where you you tend to be the one who knows this is the form you do to do this this type of transaction or this transfer, this election, whatever it happens to be. So I figured yeah. you probably were pretty, at least seasonally, in the weeds on the tax side. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and I love it. I think that combo service of investment management with tax preparation and financial planning, um, it, it all gels together. And if you have your fingers right on the tax software and you have live um, tax return information at your fingertips, 
your ability to provide, you know, strong proactive advice during the year. Um, that might be an investment related conversation with, you know, triggering capital gains or, or this or that, drawing RSP contributions, RIF withdrawals, um, you name it. You can really model that in the tax software um, and, and explain in advance what that's going to look like. So uh, we do a lot of that work in December. And I think it's, it's a really good synergy having the tax service with everything else. You know, it, I'm curious here, there's this ongoing conversation, two of them, I think, in the FPAC forums right now about what financial planning software doesn't model well. So I think there's a conversation about RDSP being sort of tough to model. Um, GIS is another one that doesn't model well. Yeah. What does the tax planning software not model well? Uh, well, anything multi-year, I guess you could say, you know, you, you need your financial planning software still to, to do longer term forecasting. Uh, tax software is really one year at a time. So I guess um, the forecasting um, more than one year in advance is, is challenging. Um, but, you know, tax software, it's, it's good for tax calculations. And that, that's about it, really. Yeah. But it might not be useful for determining whether you should elect or uh, opt out of an election, for example, or opt out of a rollover. Sorry. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I would okay. agree. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's good. Thanks. So you are um, super technically proficient. We went through the list of designations before, and I'm constantly impressed with your depth of answers, um, you know, in FPAC forums or in your blog posts, that kind of thing. Um, Thank you. It's it is very impressive, Aaron. You're you're really solid here. Um, how do you, what do you do to stay on top of all that stuff? What's the you know you, you have to run a practice. You have to see clients. Where do you find time? What resources do you use to make sure that all that other stuff stays current? Uh, having maybe less hobbies. <laughs> <laughs> My wife makes fun of me all the time because she says the only thing you ever read like late at night in bed is either financial planning material, tax material, um, or hockey. <laughs> okay. it, if I'm looking at my phone, it's usually either about the Colorado avalanche or about something financial planning related. So, you know, it takes time to, to read it. I think to be really good at, it, you have to just have a, a, an interest, you know, you can't fake it. I don't think, uh, and be technically solid. Um, so writing also forces you to, enhance your knowledge because if you're going to put something on paper and and you expect someone to read it man you don't want to be wrong about anything that you're writing so um i would say you know if encourage yourself to to try and write a blog post or you know even if it's just on linkedin and you don't have a a, a proper website forum you know you can do posts on on linkedin and share information and um you know, even if it's a bit of a regurgitation of the same information that's out there, uh, you doing it yourself has a lot of value because you, you're forced to make sure that, um, yeah, that, that is correct. And sometimes you think you know, but when you start writing, you'll kind of test your knowledge a little bit. There'll be some little glimmer of of something that you're not quite a hundred percent sure if it's technically correct or not. So then, you know, you gotta, you gotta dig into it. You gotta research it. Um, and, and another thing is just, I think, where do you go for your information? So for me, I'm always trying to, to actually read the official source, um, and, and not read a secondary, uh, regurgitation of something. So if I want to know about, you know, RDSP rules, I'm going to the government website. They've got all the information. It's it's really well laid out, um, but it's technical, and and you know you, you got to kind of weed weed your way through it. But I think going to the source is always um, really important when you're trying to to learn and educate yourself. So yeah, yeah, I I do agree with that. Um, you know, I keep my copy of the Income Tax Act handy. It's uh, yeah. yeah. It, you, you do have to. Um, I find the biggest problem with the Government of Canada website, yes, the technical information is all there. Context is often lacking. It's, you know, they sort of present like every rule is there, 
uh, without any regards for context. So. Yeah, that's that's true. Yeah. And and it's, depending on the website, it's not always, I don't think, totally crisp all the time either. Um, yeah. And uh, with the OAS stuff, I know we'll get into it a little bit, but I think there's, there's some room for improvement even yeah. as well. That's a good example. I agree with that. So the first time that I think I saw your writing was this article you did a few years ago where you had sort of something like three, um, I don't know if it's three secrets, but like three secrets of OAS or three planning points around OAS. I, I don't remember the exact title, sorry, but um, yeah. can you talk a little bit about what you came up with there? Sure. Um, so there, there, there was actually two articles that I had written. Um, and and it started with one that was uh, the predecessor almost to the one that you're thinking about. It was around OAS deferral. So it had just, you know, the five-year anniversary of when you could first start postponing your OAS past 65 had just passed. And I, I was going through a, a really unfortunate situation with one of my clients who had postponed uh, and then tragically passed away um, in a very short amount of time. And so I was, you know, speaking with the widow and, and one of the things that I had thought of was just, you know, oh man, like we had this plan to postpone OAS for this reason. And then, um, you know, the husband got sick and in a short amount of time was no longer with us anymore. And I, I really didn't know what the options were at that time, as far as, you know, is, is that just totally forgone or is there anything that can be done? So um, I had actually reached out to another financial planning forum, which I'm a member of uh, through the RFP designation, the Institute of Advanced Financial Planners. Uh, we got a really excellent member forum there. And I said to the group, hey, is there, is there anything that can be done here? And it was one of the questions that uh, at the time, not really, there wasn't a lot of really affirmative um, feedback on it. So I kept digging. Um, and again, this is kind of maybe back to the technical side, like if you, you got to keep digging sometimes and, and keep asking. So um, I, I got linked in with um, Doug Runchy, who's an expert in this field. And he showed me, you know, right in the OAS Act where it states that uh, executor is able to actually apply on behalf of a deceased individual if they had deferred beyond 65. And you can reach back, not the whole length of time, but you could reach back one year. Yep. So you've got an executor who's, um, you know, grabbing one year of OAS essentially, and, and that's falling into, um, into, you know, the we, we put it on a rights or things filing, um, which as a result, there's not much else that's in a rights and things tax return. So in a situation where there might be some clawback, uh, you end up keeping the whole thing. So um, it, was, it was really kind of quite interesting. And then through that process, you know, there's just kind of the tentacles started to spread out and say, okay, well, th that was, you know, a really interesting thing to figure out. And what, what other planning ideas can come out of some of this similar type of way of thinking? So then, um, you know, I, I hopped on our tax software and I started modeling a few things. And, um, you know, it became obvious really quickly that if you were in a situation where you had started your OAS after 65 and you have a enhanced amount each year, that your clawback ceiling is no longer the, the normal clawback ceiling. And this is, this is where I think the government website is flawed because they don't speak about this. They only talk to you about what's the, the clawback range if you start your OAS at age 65. And that's all they talk about. Um, so, you know, your normal range is roughly um, 80,000 to 130 you know, low 130,000s uh, for this year. Um, but if you start your OAS late, then you receive more OAS. And just because of the way that the clawback is calculated, every dollar over the, the clawback floor, you lose 15 cents. If you have a, a larger base, then it takes longer to erode all of your OAS. So 
really there's a there's a, a range at the high end um, of the clawback ceiling that really it depends on how much you're receiving. So the the ceiling is really more of a, a range between 133 and 150 thousand for this year. So if, if you waited to age 70 to start, your upper end clawback ceiling is is 150k, and that's not really posted anywhere. So um, the idea was just around you know, you can really make a wrong decision if you're a high income individual uh, and you're talking about your OAS. Um, if you're trying to base all your decisions on 130,000 and say you've got a large RIF account and you your retirement income is 135,000 every year. Um, if you just start your OAS at 65 because that's what everyone does, you're gonna lose it all. But if, if you, it, it's just so clearly obvious that higher income individuals really benefit a lot to postponing to 70. So that, that, that was kind of part of the thing that I talked about in that article. Um, and then the other thing was just around when you make your application, you have this same ability. If, if you've waited beyond 65, you can apply. And when you're applying, you can backdate the starting of your OAS to, to be you know up to a year earlier to your application date. So you can really kind of be strategic in that first year of your OAS and in what tax year you want it to fall into. Say you're retiring at 65 or, or 66 and you are still making a good wage um, and it, you might be in, in clawback territory, but you know that once you've stopped working, you're no longer going to be there. Well, you could, you might want to start your OAS at 65, but because you have that income, you can apply the following year, base it off age 65, but receive it in the next calendar year, and it would be taxed in the next calendar year when your income is going to be lower. And um, it's a way to really kind of shift that around and be strategic uh, right at the front end. And the other just really cool thing I think about that is if, if, if you do that backdate it for a year and you make the app, you file your paperwork, say in November, December, they're not going to process that until the next calendar year because it takes time. So you end up receiving a lump sum payment for the prior year, plus, you know, the whole next year's 12 months of regular payments, you get two years of OAS payments in one calendar year. And the same, same calculation of the clawback still applies. So uh, the 15 cent uh, erosion. Now you could like, say, if you start at 70, you're going to get $10,000 plus, but times two years, 20,000. And you're going to have a upper clawback threshold of about 220,000 now. Um, so for people who have really high incomes, that might be the only way that they ever are able yeah, to extract sure. anything. Yeah. Now yeah. you can, you can argue, and I think it's a valid argument to say people at that snap bracket, like they, they shouldn't, this OAS isn't really designed for them. And I understand that argument. Um, but my whole thinking about it was you should, you should know what your options are. And then you can make your own decision around, you know, how you feel about it. Um, but, you know, I think I was the first one that actually put that in into on paper. So yeah. certainly the first time I ever saw it. And I thought, yeah, that's a great concept. What I liked about this too, Aaron, overall, was you really showed the value of thinking about the problem more deeply, right? Of, of saying, yes. notwithstanding, like if it's OAS or whatever you have, but that often when you step back and say, okay, do I really understand the rules here? Mm -hmm. You can find benefits that may not have been considered. So, you know, it's, I like to show you, I, I do show the 130 to 150 thing in class because it's a good example of that, applying that second order thinking. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. No, I, I agree. Um, I try and think of, you know, whether it's OAS or different types of, accounts, you know, RRSPs, RESPs, RDSPs, whatever it is, I try and ignore the, 
the use that everyone tells you this is what it should be used for and just focus on the actual mechanics of the account itself. Because if you think of it more as a tool, like RESPs are perfect example, you know, they're for education. That's certainly how they work best. But if you ignore the education side of it and just think about how does this thing work and you know, it's a tool that accomplishes something. Um, there's some really neat planning that you can do around those those types of accounts too. I often, I mean, income splitting for high income families, right? That RESP is, to, to my mind, the bigger benefit for high net worth families is the income mm -hmm. splitting. The grants are kind of blah when you have, you know, somebody's going to max that thing out. So yeah. yeah, I'm with you there. Absolutely. So on this topic of, you know, using other accounts and so forth, you know, um, we've had a little bit of a discussion now about the first time, sorry, I'm going to get it wrong every time, the tax-free <laughs> home savings account, the FHSA. The, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Tax-free first home savings account. Sorry. Um, I, I don't know how long it's going to take me to get the acronym right. I know. I, yeah. So could have chosen the letters that are in the name to get whatever. Anyways. Um, so what do you think overall, first off, do, do you care? And maybe this goes back to your comment a minute ago about just understanding the, the nuances or the, the uses. Do you care or do you think a financial planner should care whether or not this is good tax policy? Um, I care because I think you should. I think it's a responsibility if you're you know, a Canadian that you should care about what's going on big picture in your country. Um, but I don't care to the point where I'm going to be frustrated and ignore it either. You know, at the end of the day, you've got to figure out how these accounts work and how to use them for your clients, because that's what they're expecting you to do. Um, so I, I don't think this is going to help housing affordability. I think it's going to do the opposite because you're, you're kind of throwing throwing gas on the fire. But um, if you can ignore that, and, and with this one, you have to also ignore that there's maybe a, a better way or a simpler way to, to get the same result by using the existing RSP home buyers plan structure. Um, and you maybe didn't need a brand new account type to, to do some of those things. But it, it you know, you, you can have an opinion on that. And I think you're going to have conversations with your clients just because you're going to talk to them about what's going on in the landscape. Um, and it's important to have those conversations, but at the end of the day, you can't just be annoyed with something and say, I'm not going to use it. You know, there's a tool there and we're going to, we're going to look into it. We're going to use it. Right. Um, and it's going to be a good tool. I mean, for, for people who are using it, it's going to, I think, immediately jump up to be the, the primary account that your first dollar of savings would go into if you're planning to buy your first home in the next several years, right? Um, to not use it, I think, would be kind of foolish um, because you're you're going to be turning away um, tax tax savings in doing so. Um, now, for people who are not certain what their savings are going toward, you know, they might have competing goals like a lot of people do, you know, could be, yeah, we want a house, but we also want a car and we also want a vacation and all these other things. Well, there, there's still going to be a use for accounts like TFSAs if, if there's uncertainty. Um, but for those who are really focused and know for sure that they're, you know, in the next several years going to be buying a home, you can't deny that um, the ability to get a front end tax deduction, grow your money without any tax consequence, and then withdraw it with no tax consequence as well. It's a pretty good deal. It is. It, it sort of is like a micro version of the uh, U.S. Roth IRA. That way, it's yeah. Um, although without the fifty nine and a half restriction. So yeah. Yep. It's, um, so. <clears throat> You have come up with already some use cases here. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have a couple of use cases you want to talk us through with the yeah. uh, FHSA? Sure. And and I think the the overarching theme here is that it it's going to muddy the landscape a little bit, and people are going to have choices that they didn't have before, and and have quite a few different choices as well. And 
unless there's a strong education of the consumer, I think there's going to be a lot of people out there who are kind of unsure what to do and, and where to save their money. Um, there's always there's already a lot of discussion around TFSA versus RSP, and this is just going to really, I think, challenge people that much more to say, where the heck should I be putting my money? Um, so the, you know, the, the, the avenue in which you start savings is important here too. Um, so if you're, uh, and, and we don't know all the details as well. So like one of the, one of the very important factors with RSP contributions when you're, when you're young and, you know, potentially not earning very much in your job yet is the fact that you can put money in your RSP and you don't have to claim the tax deduction at that year. Um, you can save it for the future when you have a, you know, an increase, uh, you get, you get a raise or you have children and, and now all of a sudden you're in a mar higher marginal tax bracket. Maybe you have a kid or two and RSP deductions are going to get you some Canada child benefit savings. And there's some double whammies you can do there. Um, so we don't know if, if a contribution into a first home savings account is going to give you that same flexibility. Um, so if it doesn't, I could see a scenario where you've got someone who, you know, 18 year old, just out of school, uh, very low income. Um, are they going to want to save in a first home savings account? Because the tax deduction is not really going to mean anything for them. You know, they're, they're probably not taxable anyways. If you can't defer that deduction to a future year, that tax side of it's going to be wasted. So those individuals, maybe they still look at the RSP um, with the longer term goal of doing a sideways transfer from the RSP to the first home savings account, because then they give themselves the flexibility to choose the timing of their tax deduction, ultimately are looking to buy a home. So they're going to be you know, going in via the RSP sideways to the first home savings account. And then ultimately that's where the withdrawal comes out totally tax-free. Um, so, you know, there's um, just scenarios where these accounts are going to work in combination um, to get the best end result. Um, that, that whole scenario, you, you could just throw it out in the garbage if the first home savings account lets you choose the time of your uh, deduction. But we, you know, it's one of those things that it's kind of fun just to think about right now, because you don't know exactly what the rules are going to be. Um, as, as far as uh, another use case, um, this is one that I thought of kind of earlier on was just, you know, if, if you have, uh, and, and this, an important distinction uh, is just the age in which you can use this new account as well. Um, when it was first kind of hinted in the budget, uh, or no, when was it? It's on the um, yeah, liberal policy platform. Yeah, it was on the policy platform. Um, they hinted at this and they said that it would be for those who are 40 and younger. Um, but they've changed that and opened it up to people of all ages. So um, that's important because I think you have a lot of um, people who are kind of of more modest means that could that could really use the, the tax um, free withdrawal side of it without the ongoing repayment requirements that you have with the home buyer's plan. So home buyer's plan, you can take up to 35 K out, but then there's uh, an obligation to put it back in over the course of the next 15 years. And if you don't, it gets added to your income. Um, so there's kind of a cash flow burden for the next 15 years that that comes with using the home buyer's plan. And if you're really kind of strapped from a cash flow perspective, that might not be the most appealing account type um, or a program to use. So I could see scenarios where you've got kind of modest means individuals with, um, you know, a small but not great amount of savings in RRSPs who could use this um, to get into, you know, a, a condo for retirement or, or something like that, where the burden or the, the, the hill to climb has been the down payment. Um, 
and you know take money out of the RSP and having it taxable certainly doesn't sound very good. Um, but if you can shift that money over a few years into a first home savings account and then have your down payment money tax free and and without the the cash flow burden going forward, uh, that's going to be pretty attractive, I think, for people who are looking to secure housing going into retirement and and not wanting to, um, you know, just be subject to having a fixed income and escalating rent or just not having control over, over rent prices in the future. Um, and before the people listening to this start jumping on me saying, well, what kind of a house could, could you possibly afford? You have to remember that we, we have a country where there's a lot of um, rural areas or, you know, even Regina, Saskatoon, um, there's, there's locations out there where you can still get into housing or condos, you know, in the sub 200,000 range. And, um, you know, the, the down payment that we're talking about to get into something like that, it's totally within the $40,000 range of the first home savings account. So, um, yeah, that, that, that's just an important thing to note that, there is still affordable housing, even if it's if it might not be in your jurisdiction. So yeah, anybody who's listening to the podcast regularly will have heard me talk about getting my daughter into a condo in the sub 200 range here. And I absolutely agree with that. Um, you're not going to do this in downtown Vancouver. And it's no. not housing for everybody. But yeah, if you're, you're right, if you've got somebody in um, sort of that 40 plus and they you know getting a starter home there are options out there that's right yeah yeah um and i know we like to focus on the headline numbers around uh, housing affordability but yeah there's a huge variation within those that's right um so the any other use cases you wanted to cover those are two good ones i, I agree with um those. yeah i mean the, the, then then there's certainly going to be the people who maybe don't need it for because they don't need it because they're well off, but um, they can still use it right to their advantage. So um, the obvious one is just, you know, rich parents uh, who have extra money and, you know, those parents are probably funding their kids TFSAs right now. Um, so this is just another account that they'll be able to, to funnel some additional money in. And if um, you use it for a house for, for the adult child, that's great. Um, and if not, they can uh, eventually shift it over into an RSP and essentially you end up with an extra $40,000 of, of RSP room. So whether it's a, a parent doing that for their, their child, adult child, or just a, a young successful individual who wants to maximize their long-term tax deferred retirement money, um, you can use the FHSA as, a, as an avenue to get into you know, a, a larger RSP account at the end of the day. So there, there could be some people out there who um, use the FHSA with the mind that they're actually going to plan when they buy a house to use the home buyer's plan because they like the idea of being able to repatriate that money back into their retirement account over, which, you know, over decades having money in an account that's tax sheltered, it, the benefits of that really add up. So um, some people might use the FHSA uh, knowing that they're going to eventually transfer it into their RSP and they're going to use the home buyer's plan because they want to be able to, um, to pay that money back. So uh, just different use cases. You can see how situational this is going to be. Um, and it's going to be a lot of fun for financial planners to try and figure out uh, what the, the best long-term case is going to be for, for those who have the flexibility to choose um, which, which one. And I think for the person who's willing to do some, some work here, you're going to find there are options or there's scenarios where, you know, tr the traditional, you know, RSP, TFSA, you do get that, that third option now. Yeah. And there are going to be places where it makes the most sense. So yeah, that's that's good. Um, and I think you presented a really great reason to just pay attention to these rules as they roll out. I, I expect that we're going to see legislation in the fall here, ideally. And we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> we'll I, see. 
I know. Um, yeah, the uh, investment executive does this uh, tracker of uh, election and budget promises and how those have worked out, and it's uh, interesting. It's not not all something not less all than one hundred percent. I think it's it is something less than one hundred percent. Yeah, um, Canada disability benefit. Where are you at? So mm -hmm, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so then my other my concern with this thing Aaron is primarily around maybe not primarily but I think asset allocation is going to be a tough one here I I have a hard time you know like maybe the the parents who are putting money in for the kid where it's really like not home buyers money it's going to be long term but I think 90% of these accounts would there be any reason that you wouldn't just be holding GICs here yeah, I mean, um, kind of follows your traditional advice, I think anything short term, short term money should be locked down into something that's protective in nature, because um, you don't want to risk uh, going through a market decline at the exact moment that you need to take that money out, because um, then you're locking in your losses. So I agree for, for those who are using this for the pure purpose of the home down payment you're going to want to invest this uh, in a protective way, uh, and, you know, similar to how you would look at um, an, an education savings plan, um, you know, scaling back your risk, the closer to post-secondary age for your children. Um, you know, I think you'd follow the same rules to say, is it short-term money or long-term money? Yeah, I think it's going to be, I do have this little concern here where, you know, if you're if you're using RSP plus homebuyers plan, you're you know maybe putting it into a balanced fund or that kind of thing, and you're mm -hmm. not so concerned there. Although, I mean, knock balanced funds if you want, but you know the idea that you can invest with at least something of a a, a long time horizon, um, but using a balanced fund kind of manages that a little bit. Whereas here, yeah. you you're really going to have to have a like a one hundred percent short-term focus it, it's yes. uh, yeah I don't I think that's going to be a little bit of calculus that's going to um, going to be hard to work into you know what you're talking about before that comparison of account types mm -hmm. so. yeah I, I agree I agree um, you're, you're probably going to have people out there doing it on their own that are so drawn in to the idea that um the growth is tax-free as well if they use it for a home and and seeing in their local markets that housing affordability is really challenging i think you're going to have people stretching the limits of what's really smart and really shooting for those home runs and you could see some people really losing out i think just because of they're not applying you know that i think more pragmatic approach and they're they're trying to to stretch a little bit too hard, right? So this is not investment advice, but no, you know, I'm, I'm just saying you know <laughs> yeah, I'm just yeah. looking at you know the the consumer um, who's yeah. who's maybe um, doing things that they shouldn't be doing. Yeah, this is the uh, DIY it into the triple leveraged ETF, right? Like yes, yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, all right. Um, yeah. Again, not investment advice. No. So, mm -hmm. um. I'm curious here, Aaron, you know, again, going back to your technical proficiency and your willingness to dig into these problems, can you talk a little bit about how this plays out with your client communications? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, I would say some of my clients are, are very technically um, proficient on their own. And, and for those that are and, and want to engage in that technical side of the conversation and really get into the weeds. I'm happy to do that. I love doing that. Um, I've got lots of clients who are engineers or even CAs um, of, in their own right, but they're just looking for um, someone to bounce ideas off of, someone to, to make sure that what they had already been doing uh, makes the most sense and they're not missing something. Um, sometimes I would say you know, they're engaging with us a little bit for support for their spouse who is not so uh, financially inclined. And, um, you know, we're the fees that they pay to us for our, you know, for our services, it's, they might look at it almost as if it's a bit of an insurance policy premium, because if something were to happen to them, they know that 
there's someone that um, is going to be there to to help the surviving family um, carry carry on the family finances. And um, so so that's uh, a little bit of a transgression, I suppose. But um, I would say there, there's just different types of clients for sure, and um, some are technically uh, at the point where they're very interested in all the details and um, very happy to have those conversations. And there's, you know, a lot of my clients who are just looking at, you know, at me to provide them with a recommendation and they trust that I know what I'm doing and they don't necessarily need to, to get into the weeds with me. Um, but um, I think they appreciate that I'm staying on top of it. So would you have clients out there who know what a rights and things return is, for example? Is that, uh, like, um, I guess with your CA clients, they would. Yeah, but, uh, I would have yeah. a couple. I would have a couple, yeah. but definitely, you know, maybe, I don't know, four or 5%. Uh, it'd be a very small subset for sure. Um, okay. And so for those that wouldn't have that knowledge, you know, got to just find the right words to use to explain it in a way that it makes sense um, and trying to use as few jargon type words as possible um, is helpful. Yeah, absolutely. It is. Uh, and I find this interesting, this comment about, this is like insurance for the spouse, right? So the, you know, client yeah. says to their partner, if something happens to me, just pick up the phone, call Aaron and he'll get you all squared away. That's, yeah. and I don't want to ask an insensitive, insensitive question. Have you had it happen? Have you had a client who has left that situation? Yeah, yeah, we have. Um, it seems, um, unfortunately, like it's happening more all the time. The last several years has been really tough um, from that side of it. And, um, you know, the the earlier example about the old age security um, scenario, you know, that, that's one where I think the, the spouse who passed was the more financially savvy of the two. Uh, but that being said, you know, that's quite a few years ago now, and uh, I've got a really strong working relationship with the surviving spouse. Um, and um, yeah, it, the survivor support aspect of a financial planner in, you know, working with a, someone who maybe has always relied on their spouse, um, that's, that's really important. And you can, you can play a really big role in, you know, that transition for them and you know being supportive through that timeline and and there's an education but also you know it's just um you know just the support as well making making them know that they're going to be okay and explaining you know this is what's happening with pension money and you know your retirement accounts and and you, you got to be right there and really um be on your game in those moments for sure you know, this makes me think about, um, I don't know if you know Susan Bradley at Sudden Money Institute. Do you, are you aware of her, Aaron? No, so, no. She's American. She's in Florida. Um, but she, and I don't know how good this research is, but she cites research that says that 70%. So in that case where you have the spouse who has died, who had the primary relationship with the financial planner, yep. and then that person passes on and leaves their spouse to manage affairs, um, she cites this number that says 70% of, of the surviving spouses then will switch their financial advisory relationship at that point. And that doesn't sound like it's your experience. It doesn't sound like you, you match that. We, we put a very heavy emphasis on having both spouses in meetings, even if, um, even if one maybe is paying less attention than the other. Uh, we really try and encourage uh, active participation from both and um, asking questions and um, just, I, I think just the material that we go through as well. It's, it's it, you know, we, at every annual review meeting I have, I, I'm reviewing uh, estates and, and talking about, you know, if, if one of you passed away or the other, this is how the money would flow to the survivor. And this is what you're, your you know final estate when the two of you pass away goes and um i would say those conversations um that's when 
the the spouse who's maybe not as interested in the day-to-day -day running down the net worth statement, talking about performance and all those things, that's when they kind of perk up and, and are really interested. And um, cause that, you know, that's real life to say, if my, um, spouse who I rely on so, so much is no longer here, what's my world going to look like? So we drill it down to the point of, you know, look at the assets on the net worth. This is how they transfer, whether it's, um, through joint tenancy name beneficiary or via the will through the estate, we kind of line by line, go through all of that. And then we say, okay, this is what you would end up with at the end of the day. Insurance comes in if there is any. And we boil it down to the point of monthly income, you know, to say, are you comfortable or not? And, and you know, that, that sort of can steer into an insurance discussion as well to say, if that's not enough and you don't feel comfortable as a surviving spouse, um, there are some ways that you could look to improve those numbers. And, you know, you kind of get into a conversation around that as well. But, I'm curious, you're not insurance licensed? I'm not, no. Is there anybody in your shop who is, or do you refer out all your insurance business? Then? Um, yeah, in the last year or two, um, our, our, so our parent company is Canadian Western Bank, and there's an insurance team through them, um, which yeah. we work with. But historically, I've relied on you know, my professional network, um, to, to bring insurance professionals to a meeting and, and have those conversations in joint meetings. And it's the same as, you know, attending meetings with estate lawyers or, you know, there's lots of things that I can't do. Um, but I want to be the, the hub that helps to bring it all together for my clients. That makes sense. Um, anything else that you think we should talk about with the FHSA, anything you want to bring up there that we missed? Um, I don't think so. Um, you know, timing wise, it, it, they say it's going to be ready next year. I don't know if that means early next year or December. Um, I, re <laughs> I really don't, I think it's unlikely that we have it ready to go January 1st, but, um, I guess wait and see, and the devil's going to be in the details. There's lots of things that we know. There's lots of things that we don't know. And, um, just going to be kind of waiting and, and anxiously looking forward to the details when they come. Yeah, absolutely. I always think about RDSP here. The RDSP was introduced, uh, if I remember right, December 16th of 2008 was the first time you could put money into an RDSP. And it's like, I think we're going to see the same, or at least I won't be surprised if we see the same kind of thing here. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, and, and look at how many people have not used that account. Yeah. Or even when the, the TFSA first came out, people were saying, well, what's the point? It's only $5,000 a year. And guess what? The people who took advantage of it from day one are now sitting there with hundreds of thousands of dollars of not only contributions, but the growth side has been massive. Um, so I think the early adopters of, a, of an account like the FHSA um, now it goes back to the asset mix discussion as well. Cause if you are in GICs, then, you know, it's largely just the savings and the tax benefits that that's what you're getting. But um, you could see other people who for their own situation, maybe they're comfortable with a little more growth and, and those who are the early adopters could end up with pretty sizable accounts. So finally, I wanted to give you a chance here. You're active, you carry RFP designation, um, recertification, um, and you're active in the Institute for Advanced Financial Planning. I know you're a key part of the organizing committee for their annual conference, which I'll be going to this year for the first time ever. I'm quite looking forward to it. Um, to yeah, I'm, I'm uh, excited about it. I'm hoping you can give a little plug for RFP, IAFP, mm -hmm. the conference, Aaron. I, I think it'd be helpful for some of the folks out there to hear about it. Sure. Yeah. So um, the RFP, it's the registered financial planner designation. Um, yeah. The governing organization is the Institute of Advanced Financial Planners. Um, I was a early member early in my career because the, the two guys who hired me, um, who I was working for were RFPs and they strongly supported it. Uh, so I, I was sent to all these conferences every year from a pretty early um, stage in my career, got to know a bunch of people. Uh, it's, it's a small membership body comparatively to the CFPs, you know, it's, it's not even close to the same number, 
but it tends to be financial planners. Well, first of all, you have to be active in your career as a financial planner to have the RFP. It can't be a you know a side thing. It has to be your primary vocation. Um, so that's a, that's an important thing. Um, the membership tends to be very high quality. Um, so all the people who have them, um, you know, just the conversations you you have, and because it's a it's a smaller body of members, uh, you really get to know each other. Uh, it's kind of a bit of a family type feel. And um, there's a membership forum, um, you know, financial planners across the country, similar to FPAC. Um, and I would say the the yeah, just the replies you get are, are phenomenal because you're dealing with such high quality people who are really trying, they, they want to be at the top of their game uh, in the financial planning industry. So um, yeah, I, I love it. It was a, a big goal of mine early on in my career to get my RFP designation. Um, the You have to write a financial plan that's peer reviewed and very few people um, pass on their first attempt. And I was one of the lucky ones who, who had my plan accepted on first try, which was just a huge accomplishment for me. I was really, really proud when I found out about that. Um, and yeah, the, we hold uh, an annual symposium. So I've, I've been on the board of directors uh, for the last two years. Um, this year, I took over the symposium chair. So I'm kind of play a big role in deciding who's going to be speaking at our event. Um, it's, it's at the end of September in Gatineau this year. Um, got some really, really high quality speakers lined up. Um, so who I, uh, guy I mentioned earlier today, uh, Doug Runchy, who's, you know, CPP and OAS, probably the number one guy in Canada. Um, he's going to be coming and talking to us. Uh, ben Felix, who's head of research at PWL Capital, uh, of course, he does the Rational Reminder pod, so he'll be there. Um, we've got uh, a couple who wrote a, a book on elder abuse, um, Sabi Duffy and John Johnson, they'll be talking. Um, we've got uh, a guy named Ben Rabideau, who's very well known uh, as a real estate um you know, expert and with what's going on with real estate in Canada right now, it's super timely. And um, we, we try to cover really all aspects and it's all financial planning related things you can um, take back and, and talk to your clients about. Um, the, one, the one other thing that makes our event quite unique is it, it has an overarching case study involved as well. So then, you know, you, before you, you sit down and hear the people talking, you are encouraged to read the case study. And then all the speakers uh, who are from different fields, you know, insurance, law, um, tax, they all talk to different parts of the case. And you get this really well-rounded analysis by the end of the, of the event on a, on a, not a real live uh, family, but a, but a very interesting case study as well. So we're, well, I'm we're really looking forward to it. Yeah. yeah um, so the last couple of years, it's been virtual. This year, we're back um, with boots on the ground. We'll be in Gatineau. And um, for those who aren't comfortable with that yet, there is going to be a virtual option. So um, it'll be streamed as well if you wanted to enjoy it at the comfort from the comfort of your home. So a couple options this year. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, thanks for giving that plug, Aaron. I, I like it. And I do like for my audience to get to hear about these other education opportunities. I think that you have to be very active in going out and furthering your own knowledge. So yeah, that's great. For thanks sure. for doing thanks that for work, asking. Aaron. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, thanks very much for sharing that with us, Aaron. I think that it's really great to see how um, thinking about these programs, OAS, FHSA, so on and so forth, really can benefit your clients, can keep, I think, you engaged in the business. I think that's something we didn't really touch on, but, you know, keeps mm -hmm. you, uh, you know, sort of a better planner just by being enthusiastic. So, yeah, yeah that, that's awesome. Thanks, Aaron. Well, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Um, happy to come back some other time, too. I know we'll have you back on. <laughs>
All right, lots of ground covered there. I do look forward to seeing how this uh, first time home savings account uh, works out, first time tax free home savings account, sorry, works out. Um, it'll be interesting to see it in application. The number for today's episode is five. The number for today's episode is five. Yeah, I hope you'll join us again in two weeks when I'll be speaking with Matthew Inglis of Creditor Protection Watchdogs. And we're going to talk about uh, creditor, sorry, creditor insurance watchdogs. We're going to talk about creditor insurance. We're going to get into some detail here. Thanks for listening and enjoy your continued studies. Thanks for watching. Use the link in the description down below to join our CE program. With many of our videos, subscribers can do a short quiz for CE credits and you'll have access to our full library of content.